Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, friends. Good evening. We'll try to shorten times now. Since we have with us Amalia Duerk, who's supposed to go to the newsreel, and Professor Gamzo has to go back to the hospital, and we have Mr. Tzafrir, uh, who also has to go back to his work. This evening, uh, we'll try to shorten it for 15 minutes of uh, framing the era of constant revolution. And that's what we want to focus on in the hour that we have. How do we make decisions, whether in the public or pu private uh, sector, with a great technological change? And we'll try with the framing. If you remember, about 20 years ago, if you remember Castro playing uh, against the big blue of the IBM, this was an event at the time that was something in the media that for the first time a computer can win over the world champion in chess but there was something dramatic behind it. And what it was, that IBM, you see the ca computer here, is going to have an impact on uh, the workforce. And perhaps that at the time we didn't get the message, that we thought it's a gimmick of some sort. And I want to tell you about an event that happened uh, about three months ago. And it's the first time in history that a computer uh, won the world champion in Go in China. So all the predictions said that the computer will be able to win over a player in 2050. Why? Because it's so many opportunities with many, many zeros uh, behind. And the work assumptions was that only in 2050, in the far future, a computer will be able to win over the world champion. And that uh, software arrived in China about three months ago. And you know, in China, go! This game is part of the folklore. And this man, the world champion, he lost to the computer in the go. And this system actually uh, went out of service. It had nothing to do anymore because it uh, did the ultimate. And actually, this future that was supposed to happen in 30 years' time has happened right now. And a year ago, we saw the modern reflection of this challenge of IBM. Uh, uh, the robotics company in uh, Germany, a year ago in Shanghai, uh, said that the new moment has arrived. Not just the computer came back and promoted and advanced faster than we thought, it can also integrate and talk to robotics and to play uh, table tennis against the world champion. I want you to gamble and say, who do you think won? And we just show you how it looks. This robot uh, takes decisions in real time. It analyzes what it sees. It's playing against the world champion in table tennis. And if you look at it at YouTube, we don't have time to show you the entire video, but what we can see is also a computerized decision-making machine. There's a picture that tells you how to react to what the player is doing in the ping pong, in table tennis. It's not just the computer is advanced, but now robotics is very cheap. And both are threatening to uh, have an impact on everything we do in life and the industrial power of countries. So if you look at it, KUKA versus Timo Ball, you see the full, I won't tell you who wins at the end, but as you can see, the player has great difficulty to play against the robot. So what kind of an era are we in now? What's happening here? This picture, you can see the um, uh, space capsule uh, of a company in uh, 14 years. It's now landing in the space station of NASA. It happened a few weeks ago. And it represents a decline, reduced cost per pound. Uh, what used to be $30,000, today is 10000 And the statement that the startup managed to compete in space is not a trivial statement. 14 years ago, people created the, this uh, software. It was a very famous uh, experiment. This company today managed to reach its goal. It reduced the launching to space by two-thirds. So many more facts. How does it do it, by the way? We can see a video here, which is quite uh, known, that uh, Elon Musk said already that uh, launching to space is very, very expensive because eventually the rocket lands at the sea. If we land the rocket on land, 
he says it's going to be much less expensive. And you can see what they did. They managed to land the rocket on a certain surface in the middle of the sea, and uh, the cost went down because they didn't have that. You take this rocket, you upgrade it, and that's the one who takes the next launch. If you saw this uh, machine, this uh, gliding machine, it's today, uh, uh, in 2010, it uh, was $100 million of these uh, gliders. And in 2025, it's going to be $4.5 billion. The company that's leading, the first time that such area of consumer drone in the United States, it was uh, invented in China. And two weeks ago, they uh, won over their two competitors, and it's got 70% of the world consumer drone industry. And how did they do it? The very uh, talented engineers in China, this is no longer that China is now copies things, but they actually invented and they understood that this drone functionality that would cost $100 in 2007 can now uh, be uh, like 700 So the cost reduction is almost 150% in the cost of uh, the hardware and the software that you see here. And that's why this industry is exponentially growing. And it doesn't stop. Look what's happening in banking. Uh, the um, uh, chairman of JP Morgan told the uh, shareholders that uh, the guys in Silicon uh, Valley are going to eat our lunch. And uh, last week, I, I visited Shanghai in China. What's happening in China in digital banking is the future. And the scope of the digital economy in China, which was about $100 million about five years ago, is now $5 trillion. Namely, the Chinese are doing deals in $5 trillion without any cash, without credit cards, without loans. The banks uh, are now $5 trillion of digital economy. Uh, with the two players, Alibaba and WeChat, these are players that are not bank. They give uh, very sophisticated loans and they enable this new economy. And of course, from $100 million to $5 trillion in less than five years. We see things that are revolutionary, both in the biotechnological world. We know better how the uh, brain can see. And uh, anybody who doesn't hear and know about CRISPR, this is a gene editing tested in a person for the first time. And because of the shortness of time, I can't elaborate, but you can see a link. This is now the replacement. It's like, like take to copy paste and uh, change it to a biological function that can be injected into the body. And it knows how to look for muta mutations like uh, breast cancer and to replace it in the body in a living person. And this is one of the most significant parameters in the last few years. And here as well, this experiment doesn't happen in America. It happens in China. I'll show you another element that just happened in the last few weeks. What you can see here is an artificial womb. You can see a lamb, a sheep, that is growing in an artificial womb. And uh, we start uh, experimenting on animals, not on humans yet. And we're coming close to a point where we know in other living animals how to grow them in an artificial womb, not in the body. We talk today, we know that in human embryos today on the 24th week, they can survive, they can survive through incubators. This is a new incubators, and this is a very feasibility tensor. So before we call upon the panel members, Amalia is going to uh, moderate the next session. Why don't we take five minutes to understand what's happening here and why now? How can it be that we see exponential growth both in biotechnology and computer and drones and in the space world? That these are things that are completely different to one another. Well, we're talking about new things. Most of the answers that you get for this event is this man, Gordon Muir, the famous Moore law, because today there's a componential growth of computers. It's a, an answer, but it's only half an answer. We see this uh, exponential wave of computing. We see the computation of our iPhones. 
And if I want to simplify it today, in our iPhone, in 2017, we have more computation than NASA had when it sent a man to the moon in 69, namely the landing of the man on the moon. So uh, you or your grandchild hold in your hand more computation than it took to send a man to the moon. That's the way it looked then. Today, we hold it in a pocket. It's since 2010. Since then, the phones have improved. So just imagine what you can do with the phones today. Uh, it's in medicine and all the realms of other things. I want to say that it's just a part of this story. This exponential growth of computer innovation is very significant, but the dramatic event, which is different today than it was then, is the technological growth of technological growth, because not just the technology is growing, but the price is going down very quickly. If in the past we uh, invented the steam engine and electricity and all these uh, sophisticated systems, it took 60, 70, 80 years until entrepreneurs and startup people could compete with the big com companies because the cost was so high. Today, we live in an era that uh, the more the technology becomes uh, advanced, the price is going down, and uh, the game is uh, their fall. We have a constant revolution where technology is growing exponentially, and uh, the competition is open for all, and here we see actually the disruption, namely big companies are collapsing, and the ones who compete with them and causes their collapse are not the big competitors, but the new players those startup people. This is what it looks like in the world of computers. We're all talking about the computer power. When you look at this chart in technology, you need to ask yourselves whether there is a similar chart in decline. And you have to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future decade. Because the place where these two uh, graphs meet, they meet where there is human capital. They meet where uh, money uh, is. And this is the matter of revolution at hand. Now, of course, this uh, is something that we see throughout the sector. And it used to be in Amazon, which is now. Uh, you see, this is the big rise for in the Amazon uh, stock, as you can see. But if you've invested $1,000 in Amazon's IPO, you would have a sit. 600,000. Now, we see this in Tesla, in Apple. The iPhone was invented only 10 years ago. Only 10 years ago. We're, we've had iPhones for 10 years ago, and now it's it, it, $2 trillion in value. Netflix and Kickstarter and Facebook, all these companies are influencing the world of biotechnology, of launching into space, everything. The world is changing because of that exponential technological growth and decreasing of prices. Now, a little bit about the influences. The influences can be good and bad. Bad. Amazon, Facebook, uh, Alibaba, and other organizations, uh, they have ha uh, more than half a million employees. And in comparison, Japan's economy, the third com largest comp uh, economy in the world, has uh, 100, uh, 180 million people producing all this uh, all this growth, all this income. So what are the opportunities and risks at hand? Now, this is the fire last week in London, and this is maybe the good side of those technologies. We are at an age where robotics, as you can see, and computer power has advanced significantly, and DARPA in the United States is working uh, at, for a long period of time. And now in, we are very close to uh, the uh, appearance of a robotic fireman. This is someone who will be able to enter a building and will not uh, and will not need any oxygen whatso uh, whatsoever. We're talking about SoftBank. This is the biggest uh, player uh, in robotics in the world, Boston Dynamics. This is what Boston Dynamics robotics can do. And again, Google, YouTube, you will just find the robots and things that they are, can do. They're very close to humanoids. This is from a lab that we're working with. This is advanced prosthetic limbs in John Hopkins. This is a person who is an amputee, and he is receiving shoulders and bionic arms, and those communicate with the edge, the ends of his 
of his uh, nerves, what is left of his nerves, and see he's able to hold these cubes. We thought these are things that would happen in 2030, 2040, but these are very high levels of, of uh, robotics that are happening today. And a final point, the world of uh, computerized vision and photo uh, adaptation is something that we see here a lot. This is a, a challenge that we see every year. Computerized algorithms were able to characterize what they see here better than humans, of course, after the analysis. But this is the output. The algorithm was supposed to look at the picture and say what they see. I will just read to you a uh, black and white dog jumps over bar, baseball player throwing uh, a ball in game. These are, um, these are, this is the time where uh, computers see better than us, or as well as us and better than us. Recently, an artificial intelligence has been uh, able to read hum uh, human lips better than humans. Is you know, it will be able to translate itself to the world of uh, autonomic driving. This is our company, Mod Mobile Eye, and the next uh, generation company that has taken all these chips and the, puts it on a sensor uh, that will help people with uh, vision impairments to see better. So now I would like to conclude before I invite the members of the panel. I don't like speaking of the future. I think that in our time of the uh, of current revolution, the future is already here. A lot of things have already happened, but something that's very interesting here, this is a quote by William Gibson. Uh, he said the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. The claim that we would like to take into the panel is that Israel is on the good side of this distribution, of this unequal distribution. We're on the good side. We are in a place where we can lever this process. We have the capabilities. We have access to capital. We have the uh, manpower and the educability, and we will be able to be uh, to, to, to start the revolution here in Israel. What we wanted to share with you are two case studies, one of them in cyber, and that uh, we'll talk about uh, a new model of how we take advantage of the unique uh, assets of Israel and build a very uh, robust uh, move here. And of course, Professor Gamzo, who will be here as the Director General of the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, who had to make decisions in the um, in the uh, health sector, and he is now head of the Ikhilov Hospital, and uh, we'll have Amalia Doik, uh, who will be the moderator. Jonathan, for this uh, fascinating review, I would like to introduce again the members of our uh, panel, uh, Professor Ronnie Gamzo, who is Director General of the Tel Aviv Sarasky Medical uh, Center, former Director General of the Ministry of Health, and Brigadier General Nadav, uh, it's a Phil, who is co-founder and CEO of Team 8, former commander of the IDF Technology and Intelligence Unit 8200. Now, you're supposed to, pre you gentlemen are supposed to present technologies that are constantly developing. Of course, we could have had people uh, in, on this panel dealing with artificial intelligence or other things. We want to talk about the future of uh, the economy and manpower human capital. In fact, I'd like to ask you whether we're ready economically and financially to that tsunami that Jonathan has presented. What should decision makers do in order to position Israel on that uh, positive side that you've described, positive side of the um, distribution? So I'd like to start with you, Roni. You're on both sides of this uh, equilibrium. You are now heading a very large organization, and you were also on the governmental side. When you're sitting there in your offices, in your, uh, in your uh, rooms, in the government, are you trying to put out fires, or are you trying to think of the future, and, the, and maybe you're trying to think only five years ahead and not 20? Well, I have to say that in my experience, as the Director General of a governmental office, uh, is that uh, the culture is putting out local fires. And this uh, was not just in my position, but in the government in general. I felt that the tendency, the, the direction, the things that you have to deal with 
is that you were examined on how you deal with crises and how you deal with given uh, situations and everything that's different. Thinking of 10 years uh, down the line, it doesn't draw the attention of the other players that you need for this type of thinking. Now, when you want to plan something, and sometimes things are very, very clear and self-evident, nonetheless, you fight the lack of cooperation. You fight uh, uh, the difficulty to convey this information to the entire system, even if it's your own system within the medical, the, uh, the medical system, which is my sphere, or outside of this sphere to other governmental institutions, of course, the Ministry of Finance, but other institutions as well. I'll give you an example, the, the significant change that has happened in Israeli demography. Starting in 2010, it was very clear that in any analy analysis that we do is pointing to the fact that the number of the elderly is going to uh, rise from 10 percent to 14 uh, percent in 2030, uh, 20, 2035. It was very, very clear. And the number of the elderly is going to double itself. If you add chronic illness to this uh, situation, it's clear that there's going to be crazy demand for health care. If you add to that the very clear decrease in number of uh, doctors and healthcare professionals. I saw it very clearly. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see this. And so you get those two vectors. They're going in two different directions, and you have to reinvent yourself. So you identify this. You see the data, and you just let it happen. Nobody's trying to change this trend. Well, even if they do try to change change this trend. They don't do it in a creative way. So, okay, let's add a few more beds. Maybe you need to have more medical students or find some sort of a solution, but there is no real thinking, creative thinking. Because in healthcare, we provide healthcare services uh, in the same way that we did 100 years ago. You have a doctor in a clinic, the patient coming to a clinic, they would meet the doctor in their clinic, they would have a session. Uh, for 10 minutes, maybe if you're lucky, we'll have a 20 or 30 minute long session. And that is it. That is the situation. It hasn't changed. So instead of writing the summary of, or, or, of the visit on paper, they would type it up in the computer. They would use a particular bit of technology. But nothing else changes. This is the normal encounter of patient-doctor. We don't emerge out of this encounter. A, a, a patient may uh, uh, call an ambulance. The ambulance would come with a paramedic, and e an EMT, or, some, or uh, someone else. They would take the patient to an ER. They would not treat the patient on site and, and are done with it. The creative thinking that we need to lead into the world has stopped. And leading it, directing it to different places uh, encounters many difficulties. And I would like to turn to you. You've identified that a great part of what is pushing forward this tsunami that Jonathan spoke about is the matter of cyber. And it would be a very good idea for Israel to be ready for this moment. Do you think that Israel is in a good situation in respect to this difficulty? I think that it is not much worse, not much worse than other countries, the countries that are at the best condition, best situation, I think we are at the edge as far as our abilities with our, the fact that we're a small country and with our abilities and also with the cyber, uh, cyber capabilities that are uh, stemming from the military. But absolutely, the problem is that the risk is changing very, very quickly. And as you know, the revolution that you know, revolutions that Jonathan mentioned are growing and they're happening and having to do with hyper hyper, con hyper connectivity and computer power and all the other things we are given fantastic opportunities but everything is becoming more sensitive more uh, connected and like in every uh, econo uh, every development in every revolution it has the good sides and it has the risks and problems so on the bottom 
the bottom line is that, and this has to do not just with Israel, because Israel is at the forefront of the forefront of this technology, but nonetheless, we are defending our systems. So as Professor Gamzo said, it's medicine like 100 years ago in my world, we're protecting our systems like we protected them five years ago, but it's more or less the same thing. It means as if we're doing medicine from 100 years ago, because five years ago, the world looked completely different. Now, the second thing is, that in my sphere, in cyber, there's another new phenomenon, and that is the ability of uh, attackers. And it doesn't matter if their motivation is criminal, uh, security, or uh, terrorist, it doesn't matter, but small groups with relatively limited resources can lay their hands on developments uh, the, the development in which was fantastic, was huge, and once they encounter the market, it, that could be commercially or through something like shadow brokers, which is the exposure of capabilities uh, out of intelligence of uh, agencies, the ability to modify things, to commoditize them, and to make them a tool in the hands of small groups with limited resources is really unprecedented. And you've identified at this call, and you have built your, the, your company, which is called Team 8. Now, forgive me for this question. I don't want to harm your, uh, your uh, uh, work, but is this not the job of the government to be involved in these matters? Well, in the end of the day, it's a team sport. The, uh, the state has a very important role. Civil co uh, civ uh, civilian companies have its own roles as well. Where do you draw the line? Well, naturally, everything that has to do with cyber crime, it is crime. Any, uh, any, uh, like any other crime, the fact that in our worldview, if I am bank, a bank, and a burglar comes into the bank carrying a, a weapon, a gun, and uh, wounds the, the guard and takes 100,000 shekels, so as a bank, I am perceived as a victim, and the perpetrator is perceived as a criminal, and if they're caught, they'll be put in jail. The same can happen in, on cyberspace, but they don't need to use a gun they can go to the central bank, steal 80 million shekels, like it just happened in Bangladesh in the central bank. We will never catch that person, and even if we do catch that person, we will never be able, in, in international uh, agreements, we will never be able to extradite this person. And if we, if, if we do that, they'll, they'll go to jail for two months, and uh, then they will be hired by some company like Symantec as, as their savior. So the role of the government is first and foremost in the general culture, that crime is crime. It doesn't matter if it happens, by if it's performed by terrorists. And terrorism is terrorism. It doesn't matter if it's done using a knife or is it done. But what I meant is something different. I meant, is this not the role of the government to try and create the same innovation that you create as a private company? Well, I think the government's role is different. I think the government's role is to create the ecosystem that can give rise to these companies. And I will not surprise anyone here. This starts with education, relevant education, technological education, which exists today. Well, I think it exists in a very uh, limited way today uh, to uh, only a specific group of students, either those who are very, very curious or their families have the abilities to take them there, and this is irrelevant for cyber medicine and everything else. What is very, very important is relevant technological education from a very early age. I mean, from early childhood. This is very, very important. And technological uh, education is the ability to deal, uh, to live in the world where there are cyber risks as well. Do you only agree with this division between uh, personal and governmental involvement? Yes, certainly. The government needs to create the, the system that will enable these things, the proper regulation, the proper systems the training and the education, as we know, for example, if we need within the medical system to have more big data come in, and we want to start analyzing the database. Like, the, like Jonathan said, everything is very cheap, so you collect every bit of information that you can. In the past, we would consider whether we want to store this or not. Today, in the hospital, we store everything. A patient is being monitored by 24 monitors in the emergency, uh, in the uh, intensive care unit, and everything, all this data is stored. It's, it's a treasure at the end of the day. This data serves 
uh, for uh, creating a Watson. It uh, helps us uh, create processes or machines that help uh, life support. The government needs to uh, educate proper technicians, enough mathematicians, enough statisticians, enough uh, t people who will be able to t be technicians for these machines. Everything that has to do with big data is now seeing a, a, a lack of manpower. Now, this is the, something that we see throughout the world, but Israel needs to be first and foremost in this. And the role of the government, if I look at healthcare, it needs to provide, from a regulatory point of view, to use this information, to use this information in a way of a, a different type of immunization, so that the system, in the end of the day, the civilian system, uh, the industry will be able to take it and create innovation out of it, the innovation that will enable us to lead the world in this sphere. Now, the whole world is quite confused in these processes. As Nadav said, we are quite similar to other countries in this respect. We cannot allow ourselves to be somewhere in the middle. We need to be way ahead. If we look at the medical system, we have to be so much ahead because our challenges are vast and huge. We want to use less money. Of course, we invest less money. The governmental budget is uh, in, uh, to healthcare is becoming lower and lower because we, we voluntarily give it away to security. And we're continuing to work with the elderly education, with people who are much uh, more sick, people who have chronic illnesses. We need to have good productivity. And in order to do that, we need to have good technology. But today, especially the health system is completely controlled by the government. It's very public, isn't it? When, if at all, should there be a shift of more private sector into the health system? I'm not sure that you need the private sector in ownership in order to develop the innovation. What we need is to have the capability that we will develop, even if the ownership is governmental. These things are happening. You have to know how to do them. The State of Israel has to know how to distinguish between the budgeting of the health system, which can be cautious and uh, the other processes of giving the right incentives, the right investment in this treasure that we have within the system today, this treasure, if you take the uh, HMOs today, the HMOs, they have a treasure of data that uh, no such uh, thing in the world. I was a, a year in the OCD. I dealt with big data in OCD. They envy us, our capabilities. Why are we not yet? leading in the innovation, because that's where we have to be. This process at the end of the day has to be that I will have the capability inside my hospital not to rely on the doctor who's running around in the ICU and he has to read the continuous monitors and he can't do it on his own. I need a system that will do it for him. Look here, look there. This one is going to deteriorate. This one has a sepsis in a year or two. And this innovation is really in, uh, in reachable. And we have to connect between a government that enables and an industry that uh, gets a foothold into that treasure. And it cannot be that the hospitals or the HMOs will say, no, it's only ours, etc. Do you feel, you talked about uh, this uh, field for innovation. Do you feel today that the government really supports a startup? I think that all in all, the state is doing a good job. First of all, it doesn't stop us. It doesn't interfere. That's good in itself. All in all, in the last four years, I'm, as a startupist, I feel that the state, uh, as far as the conditions that it gives, it, uh, it doesn't interfere. And that's the first thing. Second thing, the state of Israel established the technological education system, which is the best in the world, I think. We didn't mean to. We didn't, uh, it, it happened in the IDF. We didn't uh, establish the IDF in order to be an education place, technology, leadership, but that's what happened. And this is a wonderful thing because all in all, we took a system which was supposed to slow down the Israeli economy and at a certain extent, it became the engine of the Israeli economy. When you look at the startups, especially in my field, most of the talents 
most of those brains come from the army, from the IDF. And I think that uh, the State of Israel has to do two things so that this enabling will be even greater. One is to invest in education at a very early age, and the second thing to understand that at the end of the day, we must encourage the opening, fantastic opening to the world. The startups we know here don't have a market here, for better or worse. On the one hand, for better, because as opposed to startups in France, that they think they have a market, you mean there's no market, you mean they cannot sell their products, or what, in Israel? No, more than that, we, once we used to see part of the Israeli environment as uh, the home of our companies, but we know that today it's not even an opening. Therefore, the entry of foreign companies, we just heard yesterday that Intel is uh, joining the syndicate that we built. That's exactly the system we want to have. So, education from an early age, companies uh, that uh, camp here, they all come here, we have to open the gates and to enable them to get to work visas, to encourage them, we need them, they're part of it. And the last thing is uh, the academe. Again, if we go advance, we have to change. Just a word, recently, there's a statement that I think is relevant that in this rate of change, we have to now think uh, uh, every year of change is like another five or seven years to come. Because the, the second point also, which is more dramatic, is this until 10 years ago, you would say, okay, I have to invest in the weaker segments of population, etc. But little by little, when you're talking about the future, here, too, all of a sudden, uh, France, like with Macron, they're investing in th important things. The Chinese, the Koreans are not what they used to be. So we cannot go to the United States in order to experience things and come back. So it's very difficult, I know, politically. Uh, I'm from the public service, but we have to have this discourse as well, because the best in the world are becoming even more best, <laughs> so to speak. I've been uh, many years in this world of startups, we are great, uh, but if we don't do better, then we're going to be a gap because other countries also produce data. So whatever we did in the last 15 years, the rate of change is so great and the competition, the best will become even more best. And you see what's happening in other countries. Give me an example for one of the things that you said that you have to have in Israel. I think that one of the most fascinating uh, places and we are in a discount because we didn't do the Swiss yet, it's China. Even in medicine, you come to China and you see Alibaba, they reinvented the banking system with loans and everything. They are now going into medicine. For the moment, I don't have a legacy business. I don't have big companies. So you see this Alibaba producing uh, pumps, um, $9.90 90 for a digital medical system for every uh, patient, uh, state-of-the-art application systems. Uh, and if you look the Chinese Facebook, glu glucometers, they do everything. Yes, everything is done through WinChat. Yes, so they buy a glucometer on Facebook, and when you open the device, you see the five people you're with, in contact with, and we, you, you uh, buy a glucometer to update all the others. It's incredible. Ronnie, I'm also interested to hear, you probably are exposed to other methods in the world of managing this thing of government uh, versus private in health. What other ideas do you see that Israel should adopt? I think that uh, one of the things uh, that I was really impressed by we all uh, like to say things about the health system in the United States and because of its uh, private uh, structure and the fact that then there's no continuous tooth care and it's wasteful. But in America, you see, because of the fact uh, that uh, they have uh, problems of the lack of information and the problems they have of lack of HMOs that actually manages health, Precisely in the United States, I saw much more openness to technological changes, to technological advancement, because I was looking places like telemedicine, 
it's uh, more successful there and it works better. And I found it in the United States. And when I was looking for it in Europe or places where the health system is better, so to speak, I didn't find it. And I would like us to uh, get out of the coma because we see, we have, and we say we have a good uh, health system, everything is good and well, and public hospitals, we should get out of this coma and feel Americans a little bit so that our health system is facing one of its greatest challenges. I would like to have more incentives of the state to give us minimal use incentives. They said uh, develop systems, develop telemedicine, develop things... Uh, you mean to call private companies to develop things for the state? Yes, definitely. One of the things that are happening today uh, in a good way is a digital way. Today we talk about digital health. And uh, the Ministry of Health uh, got some colors to its cheeks when we started uh, promoting projects that deal with development of telemedicine and uh, personalized medicine of uh, uh, genetic analysis or sensory analysis. This whole industry is going to develop in the next decade of sensors and also big data and all this issue of genetic uh, uh, issues in Israel. We are far behind. We're in a bad place. We have to learn from abroad what to do with critical mass. I would like to have more government incentives. The chief scientists of the Minister of Health has minimum budget, like the chief scientist of the industry, industrial and trade industry, uh, ministry, I would like to have more incentives. Nadav, did you work with the state at all, with your startup? I work vis-a-vis -vis the state all the time because I benefit from the resources of the talents that come out of the IDF. The only problem is that we're not focused at the moment. We benefit today from a, uh, two decades of technological development in the army. People who came out, they're super relevant, but the technologies that uh, were mentioned before, uh, we don't have a relative edge. And it's not by chance that we ch send our big data to other places because in the world they have machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, we're not there yet. and. Uh, Every place where the military system will not have an incentive here and now in order to advance, we're not going to develop. And therefore, to my mind, uh, the state uh, should start uh, looking five years, ten years ahead to see where to focus. Because we make a lot of noise, but we are a small country after all. Jonathan spoke about the Chinese what, uh, we the Chinese, we're an empire of, uh, 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 we're not the majority, their population and ours. But in this small country where we can focus, cyber is one thing, and by the way, medicine is another thing, digital medicine. We're going to have um, telemedicine. What's the problem to do monitors and do things of that sort? Apart from uh, the fact that uh, we don't have to get out of this home, I can do things here. Well, how smart is it to just uh, neglect whole arenas? It's not neglect. We have to focus. We cannot work on everything. My area, we do have a relative edge. This connectivity that uh, does all these revolutions that uh, Professor Gamzu was talking about, at the end of the day, it turns the entire world to very sensitive. The Israeli cyber industry today is $100 billion. We are now 10%. This is an industry that's going to grow. Uh, relatively, we're supposed to get to $200 billion within five years or something. And here, uh, we do have uh, government objective to reach 20% of this industry within, within five years. We are continuing to support uh, foreign companies and incentives of uh, taxing foreign uh, companies to let the startups blossom. And what we are missing is one of the things that we try to create, companies that are not just technology, not just ideas. These are companies that can take it to the next stage. The next stage is to build companies that really know how to sell, how to take a scale 
and to sell to places like the United States or even China. That's going to create the capability to reach the 20% of the 200 billion industry, and that's what will enable us all to, to finally, it's not going to be just a few people who are sitting and uh, doing the R&D, but uh, it's going to add to this uh, festival of high-tech and cyber more and more pillars in the population, and then it will be a real system. What assets do you uh, identify in health in Israel? What would you focus on? First of all, the assets is the structure of the system, that it's not as fragmented as you see in many places in the world. You have four huge HMOs. We have two additional bodies uh, that manage the hospitals, the government and the Klalit uh, HMO. So uh, the whole system is there. Israel managed to create a system of uh, info sharing everything that has to do with health, that today we share information. It's an asset. It doesn't exist in the world. Take this asset and now do bioformatics, big data. A patient comes to the doctor, and behind the scenes you can computer all the patients who are in the same situation, same data. They need the same uh, treatment, and you give a proposal to that doctor. It's a fantastic asset. All the big data companies in medicine should be here, and why are they not? Regulation, too much to my mind, and I'm saying it cautiously, too much privacy, security. Today, we can let go a little bit in that area and to avoid all these blocks. Why? Some companies don't come to Israel because of this? Yeah, we have technologies that could uh, use it. And if this area would offer this information in a more, in a better accessible way, you would get here, and then you could uh, break through. Yeah, but you know, everything has solutions. There's a small company that was established about two months ago that is talking exactly about this. It's called Duality. And it relates to that. How do we take this info and we anonymize it? We deal with it in a way that it's encoded, but still we can do all these manipulations that uh, Roni spoke about, so we got yeah, this is a startup. We did get the privacy together with the capability of big data. We connect the two together. That's going to be good news. All these things have the capability to cope with. I agree completely that to take the assets that we have, big data because of medicine, people who come out of the IDF, the startup nature and culture that we have here, if you take all these book companies, but at the end of the day to take two or three, four things and focus on them. Yes, we are perceived as a startup nation, but China is now becoming uh, not just manufacturers, but also inventors. So how does Israel keep its edge? You know, most of the things were said here, most of the principles, just uh, 60 seconds. The first thing in Israel, there's something very dramatic. When you establish a company, I uh, did a lot uh, after 12 years, I came out to the public sectors and uh, leaving the private sector and going to the public one and to establish a company was very quick. I think that's something we do very well. That's uh, something that's informal and it really works. And I think that here uh, the reference is good for the Chinese as well. We have to maintain this edge. It's not the government. It is us in the industry. The second point and, uh, you know, we were talking about we also produce uh, uh, depression. We are good in depressing people. But, you know, uh, uh, we know all the constraints, but we're talking about unique assets that we have. You know, somebody who thought about the time machine, you understand that it's also good for us to celebrate in a right way to have positive discourse. All the informal uh, processes should uh, produce good ideas. And if I go to a conference in the United States, I know who to go to, and I come more ready than most of the Americans. And that is because uh, we have an informal discourse. If we manage to create a situation that we all talk to each other as a function then our competitiveness, uh, when we invest in the good people in the elite, will continue to be competitive. 
So I want to steal another two minutes of your time to ask each of you to summarize. Where do you see your field? I'm not talking 40 years, maybe 10 years from now. And what perhaps is the greatest barrier of Israel uh, on the way there? Three things. One, next week is Cyber Week, uh, led by the Tel Aviv University. If we can bring to this Cyber Week 40 of the CISO, those cyber leaders of the biggest companies in the States and in the world, no many things like that. Those who lead City and West Fargo and GE or an Airbus, everybody together in one room, they come here for a week so that we, we, small we, are going to show them how to do things. So we're very proud of it. And this is something that has to be done. The, the second thing, I think we're definitely able to live up to this uh, target from the Prime Minister and others. 20% of this industry, from a possession point of view, we have to do one thing. We have to go through the phase where we're all the time protecting and protecting and putting another protection layer and another. And we're telling people like Professor Gambazi, you can choose. Do you want to be protected or you want to be productive? And this is our goal. We found, have to find the balance to be both productive, protective and productive. It's not uh, just the privacy or that uh, the, everybody gets the info. This is our challenge to go to a completely different philosophical phase of information. And the last thing, again, it depends on the relevant technological education that this country will invest in. Ten years from now, I would like to see the system in which I live functioning and working with other models of providing medical services, models that are not usual models where that manage large populations that alert the way you manage uh, chronic uh, patients, well, systems that will enable us to uh, identify deteriorations of a patient's condition in a hospital better. Everything that has to do with sensors and with data analysis to come to the world of medicine. I am positive that it would happen in the world in the next coming in the uh, coming ten years. I hope that Israel will be smart enough to uh, take the necessary steps for this to come in, in Israel today. I believe we're all trying to do that. Thank you very much for joining us today.